I uh, move the camera a couple times trying to get a good spot. I don't like to do these at night because I like to have the sunlight. I think it just looks better. But lately it's been getting up to the 80s here in the afternoon. So what I've got to do is uh, make myself do these early in the morning when I get good light because I'm just too lethargic in the afternoon. It's a good time to lay around and read or... that kind of thing instead of um, trying to form my thoughts in, in a video, which is hard enough. But I also didn't want to get too far ahead of myself. I had a couple books I want to talk about, and I want to do them separately so these videos don't get too long. But I had uh, to keep reminding myself of things I wanted to say about each one. So I'm starting with this one. Uh, this is, I call her Kathy Koja. I've always called this, uh, this writer Kathy Koja. I've read her for a long time. Um, oh, it's not going to have her name on here. It doesn't even have her full name on, the, uh, on this version. This was part of a, a book bundle I bought a long time ago, a horror book bundle, probably curated by Nick Mamatas. I'll try to remember to put, uh, I don't buy these book bundles anymore. Um, I, th I used to get a newsletter about them. I probably unsubscribed to it, but what they are like, they all have, a, it'll have a, a book bundle is the name of the company, I think, and it'll have a bundle of eBooks you can buy. Uh, like on some theme, you know, alternative horror or whatever. And there'll be like five, and they'll be kind of a mix of uh, well-known authors and uh, up-and-coming authors, and they're curated by different people. And it's kind of a pay-what-you-will uh, within certain limits. And then if you want to pay more, there'll be like a bonus package. So you can get the first five, plus you can, if you add another f uh, five bucks or ten bucks, whatever, you can get the next five. <coughs> Sometimes as many as 15 books. I used to buy tons of these things, and... Um, you have to sideload them uh, or, or email them to your Kindle. Um, and Kath, so her name's either Kathy Koja or Kath Koha or Kathy Koha or Kath Koja. I always called her Kathy Koja. In fact, until I started doing this video this week, I didn't even know she spelled her first name K-A-T-H-E with no Y. So that's how, uh, that's how much I pay attention, Kath Koja. And I should I forgot to look it up before I went online. I did go to her Wikipedia page specifically to get the pronunciation guide on her name if there was one. But uh, then I forgot all about it, of course. So and I also have a collection of stories by her, which I have not read. And let me talk about that briefly. Don't worry. Don't click off yet. I'm not going to talk about short stories. Just this one novel. I had the idea going in that I would do, uh, I would talk about some of her stories and this novel, and um, and I would that I would in general generally try and pair like two two pieces of work that I was reading that I've been reading each time I did a video, uh, but the videos are long enough, so probably it's just okay to just talk about this one novel. And since I haven't done a video in a few days, I'm gonna. Uh, Obviously, I'm more uh, talkative than I would be when I was doing them every single day and I ran out of stuff to talk about. It's not going to bring it up for me. Oh, I know why. Okay, it's not on this one. Because uh, they were sideloaded. This is before I knew how to do the email thing uh, where you, you get a dedicated email address to your Kindle and you email the books right there. I used to download these book bundles and then sideload them onto my device. So that's why the other book I have by her is called Velo Cities or Velocities, a collection of short stories by her. And it does a thing that I don't like, and it's really petty of me not to like it probably, but it, it was also in that Mirrors book that I read, the last collection I read by um, uh, Nicole Cushing. Uh, where they take, and it was a trend for a while in the early aughts, I think, where they would sort of, 
I don't know if they borrowed this from poetry or what, but they would take the stories and instead of just saying like, here's a bunch of cool stories, horror stories by this author or science fiction authors, and they, they would sort of subdivide them in the themes and there was all these th sub themes in velocities like uh, related to different, um, different um, versions of the word velocity. I wish I could show you that, but oh, it's on my other, it's on my Kindle. Man, I'm getting close to the point of stopping this video and just starting over because it's really a ramble so far. But that's what happens when I don't make them every day. Uh, on the other hand, if I make them every day, I start to feel like I'm spending too much time on this. And there was other stuff uh, going by the wayside, so I tried to 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 um, back off a bit. And here it is. Velo Cities. I'm going to end up spending, and this is maybe by, this is by a small publisher. Okay, there's a, okay. So this one, this is worth showing because uh, her husband is an illustrator, and I believe he illustrated this this co this cover. I was trying to find out if he illustrated this one, because this one, oh, this one has no credit for the cover artist, and or the cover photographer and designer, um, which I thought was kind of strange since her husband does a lot of her uh, books for her. Uh, but then I looked at some of his other stuff online. It looks like this This is more his style of art. He's a very interesting artist. So I think that's her husband drew that. There's a lot of praise for her. Anyway, so I have a long history of reading this writer, actually, because, uh, and none of these stories go back as far as the beginning of her career. I used to read her in, I guess, the early 90s. She was one of, like, the new, the, the quote-unquote, you know, everything goes in waves. There's always a, a new generation, a next generation of horror writers, and she was one of the up-and-coming ones that was really good. I really looked forward to her novels. But I kind of fell away from her, and like a lot of people, you know, like a lot of writers, her, her, her um, career had its up, ups and downs. She wrote a lot of horror novels, or a couple of horror novels into the mid '90s. She was kind of like the punk, uh, post punk, like after cyberpunk. There was kind of like a more literary, quote unquote, punk. You know, everything's punk for a while. Everything was punk and literature after cyberpunk they just added punk to everything and there was splatter punk and uh and i think the one i read by her was was bad brains um which i thought was just okay her stories were really good and at that time i was reading a lot of short stories as i still do off and on and a lot of times uh, there was some of the greatest science some of the greatest genre short story writers are not the best novelists, let me put it that way. You can think of like Damon Knight. He has a couple of interesting novels. This A for Anything, I think, is the main uh, good novel. There's a book that Damon Knight wrote called The Man in the Tree, uh, which I think was kind of respected at the time, but mostly he's known for his short stories. Um, a for Anything is probably his most famous novel. You know, people, if they know him, he's an old, science fiction, old school science fiction writer. He was also very well known as an editor of original anthologies, so he's very important to the genre. Published a lot of literary writers like R.A. Lafferty and, and, um, and so forth. Um, I'm sure I could think of others if this was a Damon Knight video, which it isn't. And uh, who's another one who never wrote any great novel? Uh, James Tiptree Jr. kind of comes to mind for me. I just never found her novels very uh, interesting. They're just very flat and empty, I thought, but her stories are so great. And so it probably wasn't a surprise to me at that time, but you know, that I didn't like her novels. I probably didn't think of it. So, and then she started writing, like, you know, there's a gap, and then she started writing a lot of young adult stuff and things, like people had to do once, you know, when horror kind of dipped again, as it does. But this is a novel. This was written in 1994. It's uh, actually 
extremely good. And it's probably, you know, if she wasn't uh, the kind of writer who started out publishing in science fiction magazines and horror magazines and, you know, the magazines of fantasies and science fiction and, and you know, horror anth original horror anthologies and that kind of thing, this could have been published. Yeah, here's stories she had in Asimov's and everything. Uh, this story um, could have been published as a, a very weird uh, mainstream novel, like, uh, you know, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, you know, probably kind of like, if you like, if you like Joyce Carol Oates, read uh, Strange Angels. This is not related at all to the TV series of some kind of YA kind of vampire kids or something, S Strange Angels, which I really think they should have called Strangels. It's like right there, Strangels. But anyway, so this is probably frustrating for her, you know, that she had this novel first, then there's this big, like, uh, franchise, which might be good, I don't know, but I know there is a... It's not to be confused with the YA books, and it is easy to confuse since if you type in Strange Angels, uh, that's, what all, that's what the first page is going to be. But this starts out like, you know, like a, a very uh, well-written uh, mainstream novel about a couple, an artsy couple, Kathy, Co Kath Koha. Oh, I'm just going to stop saying her name because I don't know how to say it. Maybe somebody will tell me in the comments. Um, she often writes about artists and artsy people. And she's from the Detroit era. And I remember when she was on Facebook a lot, uh, <clears throat> during the kind of the Detroit revival and they were trying to do, she seems very active in the Detroit art scene still to this day. I think she's born about um, 55 or 61 or something like that, some year like that. So she's still very active as a writer. She's writing horror again now. She wrote a, a novel about uh, Christopher, Christopher Marlowe, uh, which is... Uh, an interesting subject to me, so I might want to ha I might have to look for that one. That Christopher Marlowe novel is called. Oh boy. No, oh, it's not listed here. Maybe it's on this one. Anyway, what was I talking about? Yay, yay, yay. Probably Christopher Wilde is probably the name of her Christopher Marlowe novel, and I like. Uh, reading about Christopher Marlowe. But this book is about a pair of artists. She, like I was saying, she was, she's uh, in the art scene. She's, put, she's been involved in theater in Detroit. She's been in, involved in the Detroit revival where for a while they were trying to get people to move to Detroit and take over abandoned houses and t trying to get uh, film companies to work there and stuff. And she's kind of involved in those kind of, uh, processes and stuff so I, I've always found her to be like a really interesting person and a very talented writer and so this is about and this is uh, this is what I wanted to bring up about novels there's a, a, a mode of fiction a mode of horror fiction in the 60s 70s uh, thinking from the time of uh, let's say Exorcist Rosemary's Baby uh, Burn Offerings into the 70s, 80s, 90s, where horror seemed to be about, seemed to happen to normal people. And what I mean by normal is, when I think back on, on horror of the Weird Tales era, and of course, sure, there'd be like ordinary people, but or of that time, the the stuff that we remember, especially is the Lovecraftian stuff, where it's often about um, and this would apply to like characters in M.R. James stories, or, or like the Doyle story, Lot 49, they're always about and even going back all the way to Frankenstein, they're about men, usually men, uh, young men, in pursuit of arcane knowledge, right? Or they're just they're intellectuals who who are who are pushed in the envelopes of society uh, of uh, what's allowed morally, you know. And they're kind of going, uh, and then they get involved with horror and and so forth. 
then uh, today I think we have a, a sort of a this is a general I'm trying to wrap my my head around this idea for a while now it seems to affect a lot of modern fiction genre fiction especially where it happens seems to happen to people who were steeped themselves in genre if that makes sense like the people in horror novels now and I can't think of any specific examples and you know a lot of it probably comes from movies and that is like you know people who are very aware of, of genre tropes and like you know, uh, you know, phrases like uh, I even hate to say it, "final girl" and uh, and um, it seems it's too refer self referential. But in but any anyway, that's just a bone to pick I have. But these books, when you read in from this era, like the the paperback original era of like the big fat raised with the raised letters kind of paperback of horror novels when they were just pumping them out in the 80s especially it seemed to happen to like ordinary people and this is a couple uh, a young couple uh, he's he is a uh, photographer he's a commercial photographer who hates his job because it's not artistic enough he's kind of an asshole He's quite an asshole, actually. Um, in fact, he has a friend. I'm not going to go through the whole book. Uh, I'll, 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 I promise. Um, but like, he has a friend who has a similar kind of job, taking pictures. Like he takes, he's an industrial photographer. He takes pictures of like angles of metal corners of metal pieces of metal equipment and things like that for catalogs and that kind of thing he hates it uh he has a friend though who takes pictures of lipstick and his friend and he's, this person just mentioned in passing but i think it was an important thing uh and his friend is like oh it's a great you know i i have a living i have an apartment i get to go to spain every year uh, for two, for a month because that's where the company's based and it's a great job, but, what do you, but he's like repulsed by this because he's a real artist, right? Although he never does anything artistic, he just has. So he actually hates photography, and his girlfriend is a art therapist, which means um, she does art therapy for, in her case, for outpatient. <coughs> excuse me, for outpatients that are transitioning back into society like uh, like schizophrenics and people like that. So severely uh, um, handicapped or disabled or however you want to say it, people who are trying to, trying to integrate into society and they have a lot of issues and she helps them with art therapy, which he kind of thinks is not a job. He's like, well, how do you even explain what that is to people? But I think people understand now it is a job. It might have been more rare in, in the 90s. And then a terrible, uh, you know, as an older person, you see what happens next and you think, oh, don't do this, don't do this. But she just, but he's so unhappy. She says, why don't you quit your job? Why don't you move in with me in my studio? And you can pay part of the rent with your savings. And, but I'll take care of the other bills because I'm doing okay, and then just take a few months to uh, to to figure stuff out on your you know what you want to do, and because she wants to encourage him to be artistic because she's a therapist, and you just see that you go, oh, this is bad, this is bad, <laughs> don't do this, lady, it's gonna backfire, you know, which is what the and that's what the book is about, at least the first third of the book is. Um, you know, he just gets more cynical and, and more bitter and he's not working. And and one of another thing she tries, this is really all in the setup, sort of allows him to see, um, this is how it was described in, the, in, uh, in some of the reviews I read and stuff. I think it was less deliberate than that. She Anyway, she th she's got one of her patients is, does really interesting art. And of course she doesn't, She's not allowed to discuss her patience with him or anything, but she allows him to see this work, and he's blown away by this this work, which is which is described as being very ethereal and very mysterious and very involving. 
And he becomes immediately obsessed with meeting the artist, who's this young man named Robin. And um, he immediately contrives a way to meet this person. And here's where I really appreciate the way uh, the author took the novel is he tries to meet this person. He gets him to go out for coffee. He's in a halfway house. He's not really, he's not a prisoner. He's his own person, but he's, you know, but there are people around taking care of him. There are nurses and doctors and there's a, there's like a, a, what do you call it? It's not like AA, but that kind of meeting, like group therapy or something anybody can go to that he goes to. He talks the kid into, they're close to, they're close to the same age, so I probably shouldn't call him a kid, but this guy, Grant, the photographer, talks uh, Robin into going out uh, for coffee with him, and, you know, he looks at the, the paint, and he's trying to get him open up and stuff. He just wants to see more of the paintings. He doesn't even really want to talk about them. He just wants to see this artist and kind of figure out how he can paint. Um it's not even, it's just, he just wants to be around him kind of thing. He wants to know him. He just wants to see how somebody can do this. And they're not paintings, I guess, they're drawings. But, <clears throat> and what I really appreciate that she did next is pretty much the next thing that happens in the novel is his girlfriend finds out that he did this. And I was like, thank God, because I thought the whole book, the whole book could have been just like him keeping this from her and it secretly running around w with her patient and stuff but but she, if she finds out right away and of course she's very upset feels betrayed and and what i thought was very interesting is there's all these people around them think this is a really bad idea for him to be friends with her this for this person grant to befriend this this troubled schizophrenic named robin for some reason i don't know why he has that kind of name it doesn't seem like a natural name for a man to have in the 90s <clears throat> but You know, they can't, like, put the, you know, there's, like, they can't call the police. They can't, you know, he's just, they're just friends. And, uh, but everybody thinks it's terrible. And he becomes so obsessed that he actually uh, decides he's going to take care of Robin. And at this point, people, you know, the reader, but also characters are, like, thinking, well, are you just in love with this young man? I mean, what's, what's the deal between you two? That's got to be that, right? It's so the only thing that makes sense to on the outside, but it actually is not that. Or it, well, at least it doesn't go that way. Um, he's just more deeply in love with him than he is even with like. It's not uh, sexual in nature, though. Or well, maybe a little bit, but uh, it's just like he's thinking about how he's going to take care of him. I'm going to teach him to cut his hair, and I'm going to teach him how to dress himself. You know, clean his clothes properly because the guy really is a mess. And um, and their relationship gets more and more involved, and the the uh, the, the girlfriend is is drops out of the out of the story, uh, kind of drops out a little too much actually. But then there's other characters that come in and stuff, and it's really this this this. Um, It's very atmospheric, uh, creepy uh, kind of, you know, I mean, there's kind of, up up until um, well into the book, there's nothing supernatural going on, other than this guy seems to be supernaturally talented or tapping into another world. So I found it a very compelling book to read. It makes me want to uh, read her again, but uh, I have... Um, Like I said, the the reservations I discussed about about her story collection right now, I just don't want to, I don't want to dive into the story collection if I if I'm not feeling like reading it now because I really want to get on to some other things, so I'm going to save that and then I've uh, got other books to talk about. Uh, I would recommend Strange Angels uh, if you like literary horror. Um. And I've got other things on on the burner to talk about too, and we'll just keep going. That's it for Dan.